flying saucers were real? What if Hitler had a saucer and planned an attack on New York? What if America developed a radar invisible flying saucer and the CIA used alien invaders as a cover for top secret military experiments? Tonight, we reveal that all of that is true. For 50 years, the world has been flying saucer crazy. We've seen so many that more people now believe in aliens than in God. There were flying saucers everywhere. It's just imagination, but I saw them just... The truth is rather more complex. Flying saucers do exist, but they don't come from outer space. They come from Earth and the darkest recesses of military research. It all began in 1932 in Bucharest, when this man, a flight engineer called Henry Coanda, made an extraordinary discovery using a disc-shaped flying object. One of the first people to see Coanda's experiments was then a 20-year-old aeronautical student called Radu Manikatide. The saucer rose to the ceiling and remained there. I thought it was something extraordinary. It would never have crossed my mind. You know, I was only used to the idea of normal flying. Young Radu had just witnessed the world's first flying saucer. And this is how it worked. If you draw air down onto a curved shape like a saucer, it follows the surface of that shape. By literally sucking the air from above his saucer so it flowed round and underneath, Coanda found he could both lower the air pressure above and raise it below, causing the craft to levitate. This became known as the Coanda effect. It's the principle at the heart of saucer flight. It was a very simple idea, but of course you had to have thought of it in the first place. Then something happened that was to change the entire course of saucer development. In 1939, war broke out, and the world rushed headlong into a search for new weapons and new ways of deploying them. Coanda's simple idea was about to have its day. Nazi technology chief Werner von Braun led the development of new weapons from his top secret headquarters in Pienemünde in Germany. Here, he developed state-of-the-art weapons of terror, like the V-2 rocket. This was really the, the central location from which all projects were run for quite a, quite a long time. What few people knew was that 260 miles away in Prague, the Nazis had an even more secret research establishment and were working on a fantastic new flying craft. There were as many as 15 prototypes that they built, tested, discarded, and went on to the next one. And the firm at the heart of these frightening new developments? Skoda. The SS was using, and the Air Force, were using Skoda to manufacture aircraft of all sorts. But by 1944, things were going badly wrong for Hitler. He needed to reassure his allies, chief amongst them, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. Hitler told Mussolini he had spectacular new aircraft that could change the course of the war. He called them his Wunderwaffen. In July 1944, Hitler invited Mussolini to Germany with his chief advisor on weapons technology, Luigi Romerso. Later, Romerso was taken to the top secret Skoda base where the new aircraft was being developed. Today, Luigi Romersa is 84 and living in Italy. He has agreed to describe what he saw that day. Yes, I saw it. For me, it was something exceptional. Round with the central cockpit made in plexiglass and with jets all around it that made up the beams of propulsion. Luigi Romersa had seen the world's first production flying saucer and it was a Skoda. 
where you see the pilot drawn in the cockpit. The pilot would drive the disc standing up. This is one of the men who actually helped create that flying saucer. His name, Andreas Epp. Epp had invented a disc-shaped flying gunnery target and sent the prototype to the Luftwaffe High Command, suggesting it could be adapted for manned flight. In an interview recorded before his death in 1997 and never broadcast until now, Epp described how he began to suspect his designs had been stolen. I kept hearing reports that people in Prague were working on the construction of flying discs and that progress was being made. Furious over being sidelined, Epp drove to the Prague test ground to find out what was going on. I had my Leica A camera with me, and suddenly I saw a flying saucer. It had no wings, absolutely none. I took a photo and wound on the film, but it was already directly over me. Then I took a second photo, and I could see it was a flying saucer. Epp was devastated by what he felt was the theft of his saucer. Epp would get his own back later, but in the meantime, the Germans had a flying saucer. It actually flew and flew pretty pretty well. This is what the German saucer looked like. It was based on the flying saucer principle, the effect discovered by Henry Coanda, whereby the ship created an area of low pressure above it and literally sucked itself into the air. But it combined this with other new technologies, such as the helicopter and the jet engine. It was fast, versatile, and could potentially carry a heavy payload of bombs underneath. But perhaps most important in a country which had lost so many runways to Allied bombing, it could take off vertically. These saucers worked in one sense almost like a helicopter in that they had rotating vanes. The vanes would rotate underneath the saucer and were powered by a jet, the same jet that moved the, the saucer forward, would be directed up to spinning these vanes to give it lift. They were to be used as a bomber. Every machine built in those years was a war weapon. They were to be used as a response to the Allies in what was to be the final battle of the Third Reich. According to Remerser, an increasingly desperate and deluded Hitler plotted to use his secret new weapons in a devastating attack on New York. Hitler said once, God forgive me for the last five minutes of the war. He wanted to unleash the weapons they developed. It never happened, of course. The Russians were advancing on Prague, and while the German rearguard fought desperately on the streets, the scientists in the Skoda plant tried to destroy the evidence of their research. The pressure of the enemy was unbearable, and the airfield was blown up with dynamite, and the saucer blew up with the rest of the equipment. They pushed the saucers from their hangars onto the tarmac, put explosive charges in, and blew them up and let them burn right there on the tarmac in front of everyone. They destroyed the saucers themselves, but the Nazi scientists who built them had survived and the victorious allies turned on each other in a fight to get them. So who would win the race for the secrets of the Sossaman? In 1947, pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying over mountains in Washington state when he saw nine objects shooting across the sky at incredible speeds. He thought that they traveled in a motion that he compared to saucers being skipped on water, which is kind of an unusual analogy, but that 
name stuck, and that's why they became flying saucers. The sighting has become celebrated as the moment the flying saucer age was born. It sparked a frenzy of public excitement, but it was a frenzy fueled by paranoia. The Air Force intelligence began to be concerned that these things were Soviet reconnaissance vehicles because this was the start of the Cold War. This coalition was to be torn asunder. The allies of the Second World War were now enemies. Already an iron curtain had dropped around Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria. In public, West and East mounted huge displays of their biggest and best military hardware. But there was a secret war too, a ruthless competition to acquire Nazi science and Nazi scientists. Whoever controlled this technology after World War II would really be ahead militarily. So there was a scramble between the Allied powers, the Russians, the French, the, the British, even though they had been allies, to obtain as much of this technology as possible for their own side. And that's why the US government was so alarmed by the saucers seen by pilot Kenneth Arnold. As this secret document shows, it meant Russia had acquired German flying saucer technology and was building them. The Germans had been so far in advance of the United States, they thought that if the Russians had captured scientists or installations responsible for these secret weapons, that maybe the Soviets were now ahead too. The Americans were right. The Russians were building saucers, and to help them, they'd spirited someone very useful from Germany, Andreas Epp, the German saucer engineer. Immediately after the war, uh, Andreas Epp decided that he wanted to work in the Soviet Union. So he moved to Rostock and uh, was contacted there by Soviet agents. And the Soviet agents seemed to know who he was. And of course, Epp liked this a lot because somebody was acknowledging that he actually was a, of some value, and uh, whereas before he had been minimized. I thought to myself, I have to carry on. I owe it to the people who worked on it. And I started to build a flying disc. Epp worked primarily on the steering mechanism of the Soviet saucer. His specialty was the guidance part of this type of saucer. In other words, making it respond to controls, linking the controls to the, to the, uh, the saucer movements itself. According to Ed, the Russian saucer was extraordinarily maneuverable, but it was also versatile, and it had to be. It was a jet, and they wanted something that they could use, interestingly enough, in polar regions. The reason for that was obvious. The quickest way to North America was over the pole. That was a fact not lost on an increasingly paranoid America. Even Hollywood suspected the Russians were up to something sorcerous. Now the first country that learns the secret of the flying saucer will control the skies of the world. And I don't want that country to be Russia. A lot of the sightings were in the northwest part of the United States. It was near the Boeing plant in Seattle, where our, all of the US bombers were built. And it was also near the Hanford nuclear reservation in Washington state, where the plutonium for the nuclear bombs was produced. They were very st uh, strategically sensitive parts of the United States, and it was the closest part of the United States to the Soviet Union. So it's where they would have expected Soviet planes to come. By now, saucers were appearing everywhere. Hardly a city center or movie set was safe. The government needed to put a lid on the speculation. And to do that, their psychological warfare experts came up with an elegant two-part plan. First, a senior military figure would firmly deny that anything was happening at all. But as a backup, they'd set rumors flying that the saucers came from outer space. I delivered the message. Now the plan was launched at a press conference in the Pentagon. It was July 1952 and a definitive moment in the history of spin. This is Major General John A. Samford, Director of Intelligence, United States Air Force, who conducted the conference.
Sanford's job was to deny there was anything significant about the reported sightings. It does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. To argue the alien invader theory, they put a pulp magazine writer, retired Major Donald Kehoe, on the same platform as the Major. Major Kehoe, as author of the book Flying Saucers Are Real, what is your opinion of these new sightings of unidentified objects? With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. And it was very clever and very simple. Now, anyone who saw a military saucer would be encouraged to believe they'd seen an alien. Uh, it was about 40 feet long, and I think... And the rest of us would laugh at them. I saw it for so many minutes that I can't deny what I saw. The press loved the alien story and ran it with enthusiasm. The very edition of Life magazine, which launched Marilyn Monroe as a star, also launched the career of many a monster from Mars. In that article, a number of anonymous government and military experts were interviewed and made the statement, made statements supporting the idea that the saucers could not be uh, man-made objects, secret weapons, or misidentified natural phenomena. So the alternative seemed to be that they were from another planet. And that was one of the major, uh, the first times that th that theory had been given major publicity. Never before has the screen reached such heights of excitement. Breathtaking spectacle. Donald Kehoe's writings directly inspired the most classic saucer movie, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, made by legendary Hollywood animator Ray Harryhausen. The basic concept was taken from uh, one of his books about flying saucers. I understand that the government has made a lot of experiments with uh, round flying objects, and uh, which they kept quiet, and so they probably uh, encouraged the idea that they were aliens from outer space. Indeed, it appears the government was so interested that the film's producer, Charles Schneer, was reporting directly to them. Of course, after the script is finished, it uh, out of my hands, and uh, uh, I'm sure that Charles submitted it to the front office as well as to various uh, space people. Oh, here they come. Oh, there they go. But while American citizens looked to the skies with varying degrees of concern, the men in black were looking closer to home. They were desperate for their own saucers, and just like the Russians, they were looking for former Nazi scientists to help them. When the Nazis surrendered in 1945, the U.S. military was worried about the German scientists falling into the hands of the Soviets. And the U.S. military was also interested in exploiting the knowledge of these scientists to help develop uh, American programs like missiles and electronics, radar, supersonic aerodynamics, jet engines, and uh, other advanced technologies that the Germans had developed. So the United States set up a program called Overcast and Paperclip to collect these scientists and bring them to the United States. In some respects, the Americans did very well. They snatched Nazi technology boss Werner von Braun and made him into an invaluable member of the American war machine. They also acquired a great deal of German V2 rocket technology. But while they played with these new toys with rather more enthusiasm than skill, they knew there was a serious gap in their new armory. They had no German saucers. It seems that the Air Force was concerned that the Russians may be ahead of us and that we need to have our own, you know, a, an answer to the Soviet saucers. Then, one day in 1957, they had a stroke of luck. And once again, it involved the German saucerman Andreas Epp, now living in East Germany. At some point, he had a falling out with life in, in Eastern Germany. I don't, I don't know what it was. It may have been a divorce. Anyway, he ended up in the West, and he crossed the border then and said, hi, here I am. I was spying for the Soviets, and I want to tell you everything I know. And they, the Americans immediately threw him in jail and, uh, and began interrogating him. And while he was in jail, he 
started writing uh, and drawing from memory what he had done for the Soviets, the Soviet saucer plan, and what, and what it was going to be used for. With the help of Epp and others, America's saucer program began in earnest. It's an interesting fact that by the late 50s and early 60s, almost all the major aerospace contractors, including Boeing, Convair, Lockheed, North American, were working on concepts for saucer-shaped vehicles for various applications. This is Lockheed California Division, senior member of the Lockheed family, birthplace of an always exciting family of wings. Lockheed was working on a number of saucer designs for the U.S. Air Force. They all have a central engine that would point downward, and the aircraft would take off straight up, transition into horizontal flight, accelerate to very high speed, and then fly at over 100,000 feet. And this was very advanced thinking for the time. The Lockheed engineers were working on a saucer which used a central jet driving a rotor to create the coanda or flying saucer effect. Once airborne, it redirected its jet to travel horizontally at supersonic speeds. But Lockheed wasn't the only US corporation working on this technology. Convair was one of the other major aircraft companies in the 1950s and 60s. Like Lockheed, Convair had both secret projects and a public face. In this case, Hollywood star James Stewart. Well, that is quite a day I had there. Believe me, that's quite an airplane. In the 50s and 60s, Bob Widmar was a senior designer for Convair and a key member of the team which built the B-58 Hustler. In the early 60s, it was the fastest plane on Earth. Well, that really got me excited. After all, the bird flies Mach 2. Now, Mach 2, that's two times as fast as the speed of sound. But Bob Widmar didn't just design jet aircraft. In the late 50s, he was given a stunning new brief to design an aircraft which was invisible. Invisible, at least, to radar. You had to be able to uh, be non-detectable 360 degrees because even at that time, the Russian radars began being hooked up together. The only way that that, that could really be solved it is by coming up with, with a thing that was uh, shaped hmm, like a disc hmm, or, or a, a discus. Hmm. In other words, Bob had to build a flying saucer because the military had realized that a flying saucer would make a perfect stealth craft. Conventional planes are detectable by radar because surfaces at right angles to a radar beam reflect back. A disc or flying saucer, on the other hand, sends back diffuse and confusing signals. The prospect of a radar invisible aircraft had caused great excitement in military circles, and one day some shadowy figures called on Bob. When they first came in, I didn't know who they were. They didn't tell me, hey, I'm coming in here uh, from the CIA, hey, look at my badge. Oh, they made me a member of the club. I didn't know that was the CIA that came. That shows you how goddamn secret that they were. In fact, the CIA was being even more mysterious than usual, because they weren't just fighting America's enemies, they'd been fighting each other. A secret turf war with the US Air Force over who should run spy planes. They cheat, they lie, they're crooks, they disguise. To meet with them, for example, the, uh, I'd have to go to buildings that were half finished in Washington. Airline reservations were made with fake names. Uh, it was hard on me and my wife as us to live this thing and all, all the, the thing was a whole bunch of fake stuff it was almost where you couldn't tell the realism for, for what was just the phony. Bob reluctantly agreed to work on the project the design of a radar invisible saucer shaped object. I never would want to do it again, to have to live under, under that kind of a climate. You couldn't talk to anybody except 
at certain places that they selected. The project was so highly classified it was not supposed to exist, a condition of absolute deniability known as a black project. There's all kinds of black. I'm talking about the extreme black. I've lived, I have lived through the extreme, extreme black. Bob's project has never been declassified and the CIA removed all his records and designs. Well, I guess that just about sums up the story. Or does it? Because while the CIA was keeping Bob in the dark, another craft was being brought into the light. In 1961, the world was shown what its builders claimed was the first real flying saucer, invented by this man, John Frost. Well, uh, the uh, US Army are interested in a vehicle uh, which could fly close to the ground, uh, which couldn't be stopped by roadblocks or rivers, etc., and which could jump over hedges and uh, trees. There were, however, real problems with the Avro car, as Doug Garland, one of the wind tunnel engineers, remembers. We tested uh, the Avro car in the tunnel, but it was very unstable. You know, if you throw a, a plate or a hubcap on the ground, it will tend to roll around like this. And the Avro car had a tendency to do that. In fact, when the Avro car was first revealed to the public, the whole project had actually already been abandoned. In truth, the Avro car was not a flying saucer at all. It was actually the world's first hovercraft. It was also the almost accidental byproduct of a very secret and far more ambitious project, a project which had everything to do with flying saucers. Quick question, do you believe in flying saucers? Uh, not in the, uh, not in the uh, sense that people believe they come from Mars and places like that, no. John Frost didn't believe in flying saucers from Mars, but he did believe in flying saucers because secretly he was building one. This film has never been seen by the public before. Made strictly for the eyes of security cleared military personnel, it records the work of Avro's top secret special projects team led by John Frost. The 6th Viper engine test assembly was built by Avro Aircraft Limited to develop a power plant for an airplane of circular plan form. It consists of a basic airframe of six sections, excluding the outer wing, operator's cab, air intake roofs, and the flying controls. Frost was building a huge jet-powered supersonic flying saucer codenamed Project Y2, or Weapon System 606A. On completion, it is anticipated that a considerable advancement will have been made toward the advent of disk flight. And it, too, utilized German saucer technology. John Frost was aware of uh, wartime research that the, uh, the Germans had carried out in flying saucer developments that were possibly the, the basis of what he saw all across the world as the real flying saucers in the, in the sky. And that almost came at a time when the CIA was funding some research into a design concept much like the flying saucer he had in mind. The US military was excited by the vision that Frost presented. These original secret project specs for the saucer showed it could fly higher and faster than any craft or weapon system then available. Air Force documents are ambiguous about what the purpose of the saucer was. They mention it being possibly used as a special reconnaissance weapon system. Given the performance that Avro thought they could get from this vehicle, it would be able to evade any defenses and you know, attack any other plane with impunity. The military enthusiastically pumped huge quantities of money into his project. The special projects group then uh, became a, an entity on it, unto itself. 
It was given a, a place in the flight test area and now began to work on what in fact Frost had uh, started to look at as the ideal shape, uh, a completely flying circular disc. I had no idea that there was such a thing as the special projects group because it was very classified, top secret and all that. Oh, we had guards at you know, all the entrances all the time. And you had to have a special badge, you know, with a special colored dot on it to allow you into the special project area. Uh, I was a senior designer on the special projects. I started working on the uh, 606A as a supersonic design for the United States Air Force. And the design he was after was in fact the, uh, the most uh, coveted designs of all aviation designer, a completely all-enclosing bodied aircraft, a flying disc. Everything he, you know, Frost had in mind was always a circle. You know, he never wanted to change the plan for me. I think it was ideal because it was a, you know, vertical takeoff. But in truth, the fantastic supersonic flying saucer of Frost's imagination was a long way from becoming reality. His design was one of the purest uses of the Coanda, or flying saucer effect, yet, and had six powerful jets which sucked the air over the saucer shape. These provided the saucer with its lift and its maneuverability. But testing this craft and its six powerful jets was not going to be easy or safe. Ray Takuchi was put in charge of building a full-scale test rig. And it was just, uh, you know, uh, a six-sided shape, and then we put the, uh, you know, the, the we built the rig on top of it. I mean, the, uh, you know, the uh, inner portion of the 606A on there with the Viper engines and also the fan. Each rotating assembly is comprised of an upper and lower ring of compressor blades and a central ring of turbine blades. The turbine blades are aligned with an exhaust duct, which is incorporated in the stationary structure. Another special projects engineer was Ken Lockwood. I was a performance engineer. I had been working on supersonic projects in England. And when I went into the first time, I was um, a kind of incredulous uh, at uh, the, um, the project. It was so unconventional. Each section houses an Armstrong Sidley Viper engine, which serves as a gas generator to drive a centrally located turbine compressor combination. It is, in fact, a full-size, full-scale aircraft built into a concrete building to be testing the engines and systems of what will, in fact, be weapon systems 606A. The saucers were supposed to have tremendous performance because the engine was huge. It was almost 30 feet in diameter, and it would have produced so much thrust that the aircraft could have taken off straight up and flown at two to 3,000 miles an hour, according to their estimates. Air enters the compressor, and after passing through the inner wing is discharged through a series of metered apertures. Then came the testing period. What they were trying to do was tie down one of the most powerful supersonic aircraft ever built. It was a daunting task. As a safety precaution during the operation of the rig, the rotor section is enclosed within a steel guard. When John Frost, in fact, has one run away with with, in fact, uh, full power, the building is cleared in the imminent uh, threat of, in fact, an explosion. Once the fuel cells in the aircraft would uh, blow up, the entire building would, in fact, be destroyed. It was a terrifying moment. The engine was out of control and about to destroy the entire saucer project. People um, disappeared around the back of the building except for one person. One of the engineers that happens upon the scene walks into the building and simply removes the fuel line from the, the runaway engine. It gradually comes to a stop. After that, it was deemed rather dangerous to, to run it, so they uh, abandoned that. But things were also beginning to go badly wrong for the Avro Corporation itself. In 1959, its main conventional contract, a massive project to build a supersonic jet, the Arrow, 
was suddenly cancelled and the company went into financial meltdown. John Frost was removed from his own project. The maverick genius behind the Avro flying saucer left the company forever and moved with his family to New Zealand. But the American Air Force were far from happy. They still wanted a saucer, and if Avro wouldn't build it for them, they'd have it built themselves. John Frost's supersonic flying saucer, like so many others, was about to disappear into the blackest recesses of the American military machine. Well, last I heard was 606A went to Bell Aircraft in, in uh, Fort Erie, I believe it was. From then on, all that remained was rumours. In the years following the disappearance of Frost's saucer, sightings, many laughably unconvincing, continued to grow. But some turned out not to be a product of fevered imaginations at all. The CIA's U-2 spy plane was a classic black project. It operated in absolute secrecy for over eight years and would have remained secret to this day had it not been for the dramatic events of 1960 when U-2 pilot Gary Powers was shot down over Russia and then held for two years before being traded for a Russian spy. And the CIA's own history of the U-2 program makes the statement that, quote, 50% of the UFO sightings were caused by the U-2. The U-2 flew on the edge of space, higher than anyone believed a plane could fly. Hardly surprising then that any glimpse, particularly from another plane, would provoke wonder and fear. But if the U-2 debacle proved one thing, it was that unless your secret craft actually crashes, alien flying saucers make a fantastic cover story. And if your secret craft actually is a flying saucer, you can keep the pretense up for years. You frighten me when you talk like that. Frost's saucer disappeared into the intense blackness of official secrecy. And America's amateur UFO spotters moved up a gear. In Washington, a private unofficial group known as NICAP, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, called a news conference and reopened an old argument with the Air Force. NICAP was the main voice of the alien flying saucer theory. It was led by the Pulp Fiction writer who had first launched the idea at that extraordinary press conference back in 1952. Fourteen years later, he was still hunting aliens. NICAP's director, Major Donald E. Kehoe, a retired Marine Corps officer, insisted that the Air Force knew more than it was telling. We are being observed by some type of device, which is ahead of us, far ahead of us, and is probably controlled by a highly advanced superior civilization. And for the umpteenth time in as many years, the Air Force, called before a congressional committee, said it was hiding nothing. Air Force Secretary Harold Brown. We have not been hiding anything. It all seemed so straightforward. The amateurs accuse the military of covering up an imminent alien invasion, and the military deny it. So no one looks at the third possibility, that the UFOs are military craft. How lucky for the government that these enthusiastic amateurs were so well organized. We believe that UFOs are real, that they are from outer space, and that they are intelligently controlled. Except their organization wasn't a product of luck at all. NICAP was led by men from the shadows. Board members included Roscoe Hillencoter, the CIA's first director, and a CIA operative, Bernard J. O. Carvello. NICAP's first manager was Nicholas de Rochefort of the CIA's Psychological Warfare Division, and when Kehoe resigned as chairman of NICAP, he was replaced by Joseph Bryan, also of the CIA's Psychological Warfare staff. But what of Kehoe himself? These things were interplanetary spaceships. Was he a genuine believer in alien flying saucers? Or did he have any connection with America's military research into German flying saucer technology? One man who might know was the German saucer engineer Andreas Epp, who'd gone over to the Americans. 
In an interview recorded in 1997, he came up with a remarkable answer to this question. Do you think the Americans wanted to keep your flying disc secret? From the beginning, from the very beginning. Major Kehoe was at the Pentagon in the UFO department and they found out that Germany was building flying discs. But whoever was behind the campaign to propagate the alien myth, it was spectacularly successful. Nowhere more so than in the land of dreams, Hollywood. It even sparked a religion. All our information comes through our leader, who is a yogi, who is in direct contact with space intelligence. We are your friends. We are your friends. Please contact us. Then, on the 11th of November, 1987, they did. It all began when a successful businessman called Ed Walters saw a strange light above his garden. He grabbed his camera and took this photograph. It was the first of dozens of sightings over the next few years. Oh my God. I'm gonna follow it down, I'm gonna follow it down. When the still pictures were enhanced, they seemed to show something that looked remarkably like flying saucers. The saucers were witnessed by hundreds of people, from policemen to priests. Look, 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 look. Oh, look, look, look. Some more excitable witnesses even suggested they'd met the aliens. But then one man saw the photographs and reached a rather different conclusion. And he knew exactly what he was talking about. It's the Stone Cold Saucers again. Yeah! Gulf Breeze, Florida. 17 years ago, this was the location for one of the most sustained series of flying saucer sightings in American history. Most of the hundreds of people who saw them became convinced they were watching aliens. But one man thought differently. Any time that somebody says that there is something doesn't necessarily mean there was something. They have to be able to meet a scientific criterion of being, being real. Upon coming across the Gulf Breeze sightings, however, the configuration was radical enough that we could uh, see up inside. And uh, that that was up inside was, uh, was light and uh, it, uh, as though it was hot, and, uh, and not only that, but it was circular in configuration. Boyd Bushman thought he recognized what was powering these saucers, and he recognized it because he himself had worked on the technology. Bushman had spent 35 years in the forefront of weapons design, inventing the prototype of the Stinger missile before moving to Lockheed, at the heart of the American military saucer industry. While he was there, he and his team began experimenting with a radical new source of energy. Uh, this is nothing more than 250 turns of number 30 wire. And we uh, took the leads and plugged it into standard house current. What happened next astonished everyone. And there it is. Even now, Bushman doesn't fully understand how this works. But when he saw the photographs of the Gulf Breeze saucers, he began to wonder if they were using the same technology. I can see it starts smoking. 
This experimental coil is extremely dangerous and becomes very hot within seconds. But Boyd believes that explains the white glow inside the Gulf Breeze saucers, which he thinks are unmanned drones. If you modify the voltages and, and the frequencies, uh, this configuration uh, may well fly, uh, in fact, should fly perfectly well. And uh, we believe that that's, that's what the people in the Gulf Breeze experiment did. So who were those people? He believes the saucers are another top secret project developed by the US military. It was probably nothing more than another branch of us. We have many, many little caveats of top, top secret areas. Uh, I've been in many of them. Uh, I did indeed stumble across this and probably did develop it. And they did indeed have it choose that area to demonstrate this technology. Uh, I, uh, they are devious and capable of doing this and worse. They've certainly been devious before. In the 1970s, there were a series of dramatic sightings of UFOs, but these were different. Many seemed to be triangular rather than circular. Speculation among the UFO spotters became frenzied. But then this man came on the scene. His name is Jim Goodall, and he is, by day, a curator at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. But in his spare time, he does something else. I go out in the desert when I have a chance. I've been out there over the last 15 years, about 80 some odd times. Jim visits top secret aviation sites to photograph America's covert black projects. The best way to avoid being spotted is to rent a vehicle that's neutral in color. I had uh, some uh, infrared suppressive camouflage netting. I put that over the vehicle throw some uh, sagebrush on top of it, and they look around, they don't see anything that's obvious. In 1988, Jim took a photograph of a craft that had been shrouded in the blackest secrecy for over 10 years. I had my cameras out. I heard something take off. I saw a T-38 in the air, which I, which I identified. And then over my head came an F-117. The F-117 is the stealth fighter. For over a decade, it had been flying in the skies over America. Any sightings conveniently explained away by the alien myth. I went through a 36 exposure roll of Kodachrome, and I had, I think, two frames that weren't fuzzy or, or blurred. I was shaking so much. It was one of the more exciting times of my life. What I shot was this, you know, this image right here. With this photograph, Jim revealed the truth of the triangular sightings. If you look at an F-117 head on, it looks like a flying saucer. So a lot of the, a lot of, if you, if you can't identify it, it's an unidentified thing. So if, it, if you don't know what it is and it's in the air, it's a UFO, an unidentified flying object. In the years following Jim's photograph, the flurry of triangular sightings abated but the sightings of circular craft did not. Just last month, the Mexican Air Force released some extraordinary UFO footage shot by their pilots using infrared imagery. Bizarrely, although 11 craft could be seen, only three registered on radar. So, have the real aliens finally arrived? Or could these saucers too have something to do with the American military? Now, a dear, dear friend of mine was named Ben R. Rich. He replaced Kelly Johnson at the Lockheed Skunk Works. And about 10 days before he died, I was speaking to Ben, but he told me, he said, Jim, we have things out in the desert that are 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. They have about 4,500 people at the Lockheed Skunk Works. What have they been doing for the last 20 some odd years? They're building something. Dad, when you're out there, did you see anything? Let's not start that flying saucer nonsense again. 